I would like to welcome you to the topic of root structure and function. This is lecture two of the subject plant physiology, which is a component of the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology. This subject is offered as part of a degree that is run through both Melbourne Polytechnic and La Trobe University. Please visit our website for further information on this subject and the other courses that we offer at www.melbournepolytechnic.edu.au Please note, this lecture is in two parts and this is part one. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. Before watching this lecture, please ensure that you have watched lecture one, An Introduction to Plant Physiology completed quiz number one, which is on your Moodle website, and obtained a score of 80% or more. Conducted and completed the first DIY practical, Plant Structure, Form and Function 1, and the recommended reading associated with Chapter 1. These tasks will give you an excellent grounding to this lecture. In this lecture, we will start our plant physiological journey at the location of the roots. The objectives of lecture one are to introduce the function of a root. In this lecture we will explore some of the important structural components of the root. Root structures in the plant kingdom can differ and in learning about these differences we are introduced to the classification of the monocot and dicot plants. Early root development will be explored which will be followed by a more detailed look at the typical root architecture. We will complete this lecture by learning about the three root functional zones. The following image of the basic structure of a plant was introduced in lecture one and it identifies many of the principal anatomical parts of a plant. In this lecture we are going to learn about the root structure. So let us start with the basics. Roots are usually located underground although there are some species that are an exception to this such as the orchid family. Basic root architecture can vary depending on if the plant is classified as a monocot or dicot. The definitions and characteristics of the monocot and dicot plant classifications were covered in your DIY practical form and function. When roots are examined in detail, you will find they are covered by tiny root hairs. Each, each root hair contains a root tip. These functions can be broadly separated into three areas for a root. The root system acts as an anchor for the plant. Roots will selectively absorb water and nutrients. And some areas of the root system are used as a storage of food, such as sugars and carbohydrates. The main carbohydrate for food storage is starch. And the fourth function that a root can perform is to undertake chemical communication signals. These signals can be a consequence of the detection of an abiotic stress, for example a limited amount of water in the soil. Common root chemical signals are supplied by the root system and these include the cytokinins and the gibberellin families. The following link which can be found on Moodle is to a video that was obtained using x-rays to determine an insight into in situ root development. Please stop the lecture now and watch this video. In order for us to understand root development, first we must classify some components of plant and the plant kingdom. The plant kingdom can be separated in plants that will flower and those that will not. The flowering plants are referred to as the angiosperms and are a division of the anthophyta. In this subject we will concentrate on the angiosperms as most com commercial plants used in agriculture are angiosperms. Flowering plants that do not flower but are similar to the flowering plants are the geosperms. Angiosperms fall into two groups. 
These groups are based on the flower and body morphology as well as the embryo development. These groups are the monocotyledons or monocots for short and the dicotyledons or dicots for short. Germination and root development are different between the monocots and the dicots. For more details on these plants and their groupings, please refer to Practical 1, Plant Form and Function 1 and 2. So let us start by looking at the root structure of a monocot. In order to do this, it is helpful to look at the root structure development in the monocots. The image on the slide shows a monocot seed. Monocots have one cotyledon. This, challenge, this channels nutrients to the growing embryo. The embryo have a plume that forms the leaves, a hypocotyl that will eventually form the stem, and the radicel that forms the root structures. The embryotic axis, axis comprises everything between the plume and the radical. As monocot grass seeds germinate, the primary root or radicel emerges first. This is followed by the primary shoot or, coleopt or coleoptile and the advantageous roots. Therefore, you can think of the radicel in embryotic development as the embryotic root. After germination, the monocot roots develop. They tend to have three to six primary root axis from the germinating seeds. The plants tend to extend new advantageous roots called nodule roots. Eventually, this forms a fibrous root system. All roots have the same diameter. On the slide, you can see the structure of a monocot root system. On the left hand side is a monocot root system which has developed in a dry soil, while on the right hand side is a monocot root system that has developed in an irrigated soil. Now let us examine a dicotyledon root structure. Again, starting with germination. The image on the slide from the Sky Blue Seed Germination article illustrates a dicot seed. The radical of the embryo develops into a vertically growing tap root and from this many lateral roots can originate as shown in the right hand image. After germination of the dicot seed, the root system develops into a main single root axis. This is called a tap root and this will eventually undergo secondary thickening. Lateral roots will develop from this main axis and this develops into a branched root system. The image on the slide shows two diacotyledon root structures, that of sugar beet and alfalfa. The following image shows the differences between the monocot and the dicot root development. Take some time to study this image and see if you can equate the differences. You may also find it different, uh, useful to look at this UNM Biology Undergrad Lab image. Again, it shows the difference between the monocotyledon on the left hand side and the dicotyledon right hand side, early root development. Notice the fibrous root structure and the tap root structure differences on the image. In most dicots, the root develops from the lower end of the embryo, from the region known as the radicel. The radicel gives rise to the apical meristem, which continues to produce root tissue for much of the plant's life. By contrast, the radicel aborts in monocots, and the new roots arise adventitiously from the nodes of the stem. These roots may be called prop roots, when they are clustered near the bottom of the stem. So to conclude, the way the roots develop is different between a monocot and a dicotyledon. A monocot plant will have an advantageous root system, while a dicotyledon will develop roots from the radicel. Let us look at some basic facts about root depth. The depth of root penetration into the soil can vary depending on a few factors. 
These will include the species, the nutrition available, the environmental factors and whether they are in a situation of promoting growth or putting the crop or plant in a stress situation, the soil health and if there are the presence of any physical barriers within the soil. An example of how great root depth is, is demonstrated by the rye plant. This can produce a fibrous root system up to 40 times greater than its surface area. A very impressive feat. In trees and shrubs, the absorptive roots are usually superficially located in the soil, but the root system often extends laterally beyond their aerial canopies. An example of this is in the building regulations in Australia. They have a rule of thumb that many planning councillors will use. That is, they can estimate the circumference of the root system by assuming that it is three times the width of the circumference of that tree at one metre. Other facts about the root system are detailed. The ability of the root to obtain water and nutrients is related to the capacity of the plant to develop a root system. In the 1930s, H. J. Dittmer estimated from a single rye plant some very staggering statistics. There were 13 million primary and lateral root axes, 500 kilometres in length. There were 200 metres squared of surface area. He also estimated 1,010 root hairs, which provided another 300 metres squared of surface area. A plant called a desert mesquite roots may often grow downwards of up to 50 metres. An annual crop plant will typically grow between 0.1 and 2 metres deep. If your crop plant is well fertilised and water, watered, the plant growth becomes only carbohydrate limited and a small root system supplies the plant. Allocation changes will occur, that is storage from roots to the shoot will result and this will lead to higher yields. The image on this slide illustrates the root structure in much more detail. Firstly, you should note there are three zones to the root structure. The meristematic zone, the elongational zone, and finally the mature zone. Each of these zones have a different function. The mature zone consists of root hairs, endodermis, root cortex, endodermis with a capsparium strip, and are connected to the developed vascular transport systems, the xylem and the phloem. The mature zone, as its name suggests, is the oldest and the most mature structure of the root. The root hairs that protrude off the mature zone are the site for all water and nutrient absorption. The second zone is called the elongation zone. This has many of the structural characteristics of the mature zone, however the root section is undergoing elongation, a process of root growth. At the end of the elongation zone, you come to the most sensitive part of the root, which is the meristematic zone. This is a special zone, which is where all the active initial growth occurs. Looking at the meristematic zone structure in more detail. We see that physically the cells can divide in either direction. They can divide towards the base to form cells that differentiate into tissues of the root. And they can also divide towards the apex to form the root cap. Root cap protects the meristematic cells and secretes mucil which surrounds the root tip. This may provide lubrication, protect root from desiccation, promote transfer of nutrients to the root and affect interactions between the root and the microbes. The quiescent centre is a region of meristem cells which divide slowly or not at all. The elongation zone, which is the mid zone, 
is approximately 0.7 to 1.5 millimeters from the root apex. Cells elongate rapidly in this zone and produce a central ring of cells called the endodermis. The endodermal walls become thickened and the substance cerberin is deposited on the radial walls to form the capsicum strip. The capsicum strip is a hydroponic structure that prevents the apoplast movement of water across the root. During root development, the endodermis divides the root into two regions. The cortex region is on the outside and the steel region is on the inside and contains the phloem and the xylem, which are the transport vessels. The maturation zone is a zone where root hairs appear. It is a large surface area so that it can absorb water and solutes and it can also act as anchoring for the root. In the maturation zone, the xylem develops the capacity to translocate water and solutes to the shoot. Now that you have an understanding about the three major zones of root, you can relate this understanding to actually watching a lateral root grow. Please stop this video here and refer to the link on Moodle. This video will show you the lateral root growth demonstrated on the plant Arabidopsis, which is a plant often used to show concepts in the plant kingdom. In order to complete this lecture, you will need to conduct the following three readings. The first is on some notes written by Colorado State University on root structure and function. This article will review the basics covered in this lecture, part one, and introduce a selection of root types. The second is a generic reading on plant physiology, taze and zyga, on water balance of the plant. Please read the components of chapter four that relate to root structure and function. And finally, a paper written in 2002 on plant architecture. This will introduce some terminologies and some aspects about plant architecture. And so to summarise the main themes covered in this lecture, we have introduced the basic functions of the roots. We have looked at architectural root types. We've looked at the basics of root development and root structures. In order to complete this topic, you will also need to do the quiz, lecture two, part one, the essential reading, watch the associated videos, and completed the DIY practical form and function and the section on root structure. This is the end of lecture two, part one.